battle for Stalingrad is widely known as the major turning point in World War II. Over two million soldiers took part in this monumental battle. It was described in numerous books and the topic of various movies. Many monuments and memorials were built in honor of the victorious Russian army. However, it is not widely known that during the battle, the inhabitants of the city were literally held hostage. Before the Germans attacked, the city of Stalingrad had more than half a million inhabitants, including women and children that had been evacuated from other cities and villages. During Soviet times, the heroic legend of the city made an unbiased account of the past impossible. Nowadays, with more distance in time, also in Russia, people start asking questions like, how could the German army arrive at the river Volga so fast? Why was there no order given to evacuate women and children to the very last moment? Why were there so many civilians left on the west bank of the river Volga, right in the middle of the combat zone? And most importantly, what was the price that was paid for this victory? In a battle that turned out to become the major turning point, not only of this war, but ultimately also of world history. The 23rd of August, 1942, was a hot, sunny day in Stalingrad. Apart from the few raids of the German Air Force, there was no actual indication that the war was close. It was a Sunday, and many people were enjoying their holidays. Here in the center of the city, at the quays, loudspeakers played music. At 4.18 p.m., the massive bombardment of the city started. It lasted several days. I remember we went to the cinema at around noon. The name of the cinema was Appeal. It was located above the Ks. We watched the film titled The Pig Tender and the Shepherd. I still remember there was a phrase in a song, when our tanks tear along, you and I will go fighting. The film was so amusing. There was a lot of music in it. I was a boy at the time, but I enjoyed it a lot. When we left the cinema, it was about 4 p.m. already, and I saw that the sky had blackened by airplanes. The fleet of the German bombers was approaching. On the 23rd of August, the Wehrmacht Air Force flew more than 2,000 operational flights into Stalingrad. Thousands of people were buried alive under the ruins that day. General von Richthofen, the commander of the German Air Force was on the rise. It was him who was in command of the Condor Legion in Spain in 1937. It was he who introduced the practice of carpet bombing and thus eliminated Hernika. Richthofen, like Hitler, believed that a violent assault on Stalingrad would mean a rapid victory on the River Volga, the last defensive line of the Russians before the Urals. That would mean the end of the war in the East and a glorious triumph for Germany. The city was demolished, completely destroyed. There were posts and beams lying everywhere, and in the ruins, the dead and wounded. Here is the house, for instance, where Kalinichinko lived. There the first wall fell. This wall, the facade wall, it was like in a theater. You could see a piano and a chandelier, but the wall had simply vanished. The most terrible thing was to see thousands of people dying under the ruins, and there was nobody who could help them. They mostly bombed residential areas, not factories. The Germans obviously had hoped to capture the factories and use them. Nearly all communication lines of the city were wrecked within a few hours. 
Water pipes, the electricity supply network, telegraph and telephone lines were cut off. Almost all high buildings were destroyed. The state bank, hotels, the railway station and the theatre were demolished. Many hospitals and schools lay in ruins. Where now the department store is, there used to be a different building before the war. It was used as a military hospital. The bombing set it on fire and the wounded had to jump down from the balconies. They all died. Well, I remember them running and pulling their bandages after themselves. Men without legs were crawling. They all crawled in that direction because there was a temporary bridge there. Most buildings of the city were wooden, except for some brick merchant houses and some high buildings in the center. Therefore, many streets and districts were burnt to the ground. A horrible thing to watch, you know, human beings being burnt alive. There was no chance to escape, nowhere to go. It was so hot outside, it was burning hot. Even the bank of the river Volga was ablaze. Bombs hit a gas tank and huge sheets of flame stabbed the sky near the oil storage tanks. Black oil spread over the river Volga for many kilometers. It's hard to believe, but the river Volga was ablaze. German pilots were ordered to create panic in the city. Luftwaffe pilots were literally hunting people down. I could even see their faces because they flew so low. We ran away and they chased us with the wings of their planes so low they nearly hit the ground. They laughed straight into our faces. I saw them again when they passed by as prisoners of war later on. I know I should have felt sorry for them, but when I remembered them hunting us down. We were children at the time. We were just children, like those boys over there. Half of the children became orphans. So many children became orphans. The most horrible thing for the people of Stalingrad was the fact that they could not properly defend themselves. The Russian fighter planes rushed to the defense, but there were too few of them. They quickly neutralized our anti-aircraft batteries as well. In Stalingrad, unlike Moscow, there were almost no special air raid shelters. At most, some factories had shelters. The only places people could find shelter in were trenches dug in their yards or cellars. People used to call them slit trenches. In the basement there were more than 100 people. Children, well, for some reason there were not so many children there. I sat somewhere in a corner. I had a toy car with a steering wheel you could turn. I also had a small toy plane. When the bombs started hailing down, the building shook and began to fall apart. Brick walls began to crumble away. There were arches made of red brick. There was an awful din. Dust was everywhere. It was burning hot. It was like in hell. Everybody began to pray. My mother taught me how to pray the Our Father. I learned it by heart straight away. It was a short prayer. God must have saved my life. On the first day of the bombardment, we all ran down to the cellar of the theater. Shortly afterwards, the lights went off. Suddenly, there reappeared light from somewhere. And we all tried to find a place to sit down. I'm not sure whether this light was from a candle or something else, but suddenly I heard somebody monotonously and quietly say a prayer. And for some reason, we believed that this would save us. During the war, we all had a prayer in our bosom. We knew all the prayers by heart. These prayers constantly came back to our memory. We would say the rosary, and I still remember it by heart. The situation of the city was worsened due to the fact that on the exact same day, the 23rd of August, when the Luftwaffe pilots flew their attack on Stalingrad, the 16th Tank Division commanded by General Hobe broke through to the River Volga, to the northern outskirts of Stalingrad. 
Even the German soldiers could hardly believe that coming from the banks of the river Don, that they had managed to reach the river Volga in the course of only one day. When they saw the river Volga, they were absolutely astonished. They felt that the end of a long campaign and a victory was near. They hoped that they would return home soon. Das ist die Volga, der größte Strom Europas. Ihr Lauf ist 3690 Kilometer lang. I had never seen such a huge river in my life before. Well, of course, we had heard a lot about the river Volga and knew this song, Stenka Razen Volga Volga. But to actually really see the river Volga for the first time just takes your breath away. In the morning of the 21st of August, the infantry divisions of the 6th Army, led by General Paulus, managed to cross the river Don. Combat engineers started building ponton bridges for the 14th Tank Corps. By the evening of the 22nd of August, the Germans laid bridges across the River Don near Peskovskaya and Vertiachi. At night time, the 16th Reconnaissance Division of General Huber, together with the motorized infantry, crossed the River Don to force their way to the River Volga. On the 23rd of August, at dawn, tanks of the 14th Corps mounted an offensive. After overwhelming the defense, they set out for Stalingrad, taking the shortest route. The soil in the region was completely dried out after the summer drought, and German vehicles could move at top speed and practically met no opposition. Only on the outskirts of Stalingrad, the Russian anti-aircraft batteries started firing at German tanks. There were women there. They were anti-aircraft gunners. And we were lucky they had been trained only to shoot down aircrafts. That was our luck. They hardly knew how to fight land forces. We literally ran them over. Sadly enough, I believe our tank formation eliminated those women. Probably all of them died. Obviously, it was an unfair battle. Girls that had just graduated from college a few days before now tried to defend their native city with anti-aircraft guns against tanks. It was weird for us to have to fight against women, something completely new. As I said, they didn't even stand a chance. They were completely crushed. They couldn't stop us. But it sure was strange. It hadn't happened before. That women fought, I mean. So all of a sudden, the Germans surprisingly appeared only four kilometers away from the tractor and now tank factory walls. When the director of the plant reported this to the first secretary of the regional committee and to Chuyanov, the chairman of the Stalingrad defense, they could not believe it. When he called Khrushchev, member of the Front Military Council, he heard the latter say, this cannot be true, stop panicking. We were surprised ourselves. We would never have thought it possible to cover the distance from the River Don to the River Volga in just one day. That was partly due to the fatal mistakes of the Russian commanders. They'd been sure that the Germans would deliver the main blow on Stalingrad from the south. According to this belief, General Yeremenko, the front commander, concentrated the main forces in the southeastern sector. This was done to stop the advance of the 4th Army of Hoth. He would never have believed that Paulus's 6th Army would overwhelm his right flank defenses so quickly. My dear late mother dug anti-tank trenches. Over there, toward the River Don. They all dug trenches. All citizens were made to dig trenches. They were getting ready to defend Stalingrad. But the Germans came from the north. They just ignored all those defense preparations. They just walked in from the direction of the tractor plant. The German offensive opened the corridor 60 kilometers long and 8 kilometers wide. The formation led by Paulus moved along this corridor to the River Volga. The Stalingrad front, under the command of General Yeremenko, turned out to be split into two parts. That was a unique chance for the Germans. They could have captured Stalingrad within a few hours, as there was no regular unit of the Red Army there at the time. However, the Wehrmacht forces failed to quickly conquer the city. Their way was barred by poorly armed militia detachments of the 10th Division, anti-aircraft batteries, destructive battalions and tractor plant employees, the irregular troops. I would also point out that the working irregulars of Stalingrad differed from, say, the indigenous population of Leningrad and Moscow. 
Our regulars consisted of highly skilled military plants employees. Those were people that had devised and adjusted tanks, constructed cannons. They knew all the flaws of those machines because they had tested them at target ranges for years. Therefore, on the 23rd, when the employees went out to defend the city, one could not say they were just employees that went into action and somehow managed to hold their positions. This was the first time the Germans were engaged in a high-quality battle. They were professionals. One could say they were quasi-professional soldiers. They were not experts on tactics, of course. They could very well yield the weapons, though. Tractor plant employees tried to resist the very well-staffed German corps and hurriedly made tanks. Some of the vehicles of the Russians were tractors planked with armored steel. The report of General von Wietersheim to the 6th Army headquarters saying that the Red Army formation started a counter-attack with the support of Stalingrad civilians that displayed an unbelievable courage sounded incredible. Von Wietersheim, the commander of the 14th Tank Corps, after having been ordered to report to Friedrich von Paulus, commander-in-chief of the 6th Army, rushed to the headquarters, which were at the River Don in Golubinskaya. Here in this house, Wietersheim advised Paulus to temporarily retreat from the Volga and to impose a blockade on Stalingrad. He no longer believed they would be able to conquer the city immediately. Paulus was in a bad mood already. He was suffering from dysentery. Wiederheim's suggestion outraged him. He had thought the victory was so close. He sharply replied that they had already seized Leningrad. After the incident, Paulus did his best to have Wiedersheim dismissed for panic sentiments. However, this did Wiedersheim good. He stayed alive and was not taken prisoner. After the war, he wrote in his memoirs titled, Why I Didn't Enter Stalingrad. The threat that the Germans would capture Stalingrad was so serious that Yeremenko ordered to blow up the only pontoon bridge across the river Volga, built in the shortest possible time at the price of incredible efforts. The pontoon bridge was to be used when taking the reserves, equipment and military freights across the river Volga. If the Germans would have managed to get across, the country would have been cut in two. As the telephone and telegraph communication was cut off, the report to the Supreme Commander-in-Chief that the Germans had come as far as the river was broadcasted on the radio. Stalin became furious when he found out the Germans had arrived. That was not only a catastrophe for Stalingrad. The country would be deprived of the main waterway connecting the south of the country with its center. It would also lose its access to the oil resources. Next came the Urals, and that was it. Operation Barbarossa would have worked out. The Urals was where great parts of the Russian industry had been transferred to. If they had captured the Urals, they would have seen forests in front of them. There was nothing else to capture. Furthermore, the ideological significance of a city is not to be underestimated whether we like it or not, whether we like Stalin now or not. It was a symbolic city, the city of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. Stalin forbade mining the factories and the blowing up of the infrastructure, which had already been ordered on the 19th of August. The secret files documenting this have meanwhile been found. After the decision to evacuate women and children to the left bank of the river Volga on the 24th of August, the second day of the mass bombardment, Stalin was furious because he considered evacuation to be a panic reaction. The city would only hold out, and the army would only fight to the last if there'd still be civilians left in the city. This is a savage law of war. A lot of memoirs were published, Khrushchev's for instance, stating that Stalin called upon the commanders to prevent any evacuation efforts. Khrushchev wrote that nobody dared to even think about evacuation. True enough, regional committee secretary could remember the fact too. Your orders, Comrade Stalin, to ruthlessly fight against panic mongers and cowards will be carried out. We will not surrender the city of Stalingrad. Goodbye, Comrade Stalin. There was no order to evacuate. 
I remember our meeting with Tuyanov. My mother was acquainted with him and my father worked together with him. At the time, he could have offered his help to us. He could have suggested we should evacuate, though there was no conversation of the kind. He simply said, try to keep away from military men. They are often shot at. In a situation like that, Stalin's frustration could mean nothing but an order. But until now, no documents forbidding evacuation, neither before nor after the 23rd of August, could be found. But it is a historical fact that can be neither disproved nor revised today. And it doesn't matter whether we have found any documents concerning the evacuation or not. The fact is that, on the 23rd of August, the Germans were 300 meters away from the tractor plant. These are the outskirts of our city, so to speak. They were almost in Stalingrad. We cannot disprove the fact that when the mass bombardment started, there were many civilians in the city. There were even more civilians in the city at that time than there were before the war started. What does this mean? It means that evacuation in the city had not been conducted. This means the civilians were caged up in the city. They were literally prisoners of the battle for Stalingrad. Before the tragic events of August 1942, only 100,000 people had managed to leave Stalingrad. All other people were locked up in the city. There were probably half a million left. Exact figures are impossible to find. In addition to the inhabitants of Stalingrad, there were thousands of people that had been evacuated from Leningrad, the Ukraine, Oral, Smolensk, Kursk and other regions. We didn't receive an order to evacuate the civilians, not until the last minute, though there were special trains waiting to take people away from Stalingrad. They had saved everything but the people beforehand. They took away archives, valuable equipment, metals, sugar and paper. In July and the beginning of August, we saw 27,000 carriages of bread being taken away. The city authorities ordered to evacuate all cattle to prevent their destruction. The city crossings were used only to evacuate cattle. They rounded up a lot of cattle. Streets were full. It was packed with animals. You could hear those poor cows bellow. It was very loud. They moved day and night for three days. Even metallic posts were bent due to the pressure. At the same time, the Central Committee of the Party in their appeal to Stalingrad citizens demanded they should eliminate evacuation spirits and guarantee industry works trouble-free. Stalingrad was one of the biggest military industrial centers of the country. The tractor plant alone manufactured half of all the T-34 tanks. In the city, they manufactured cannons, shells, mines and air bombs. This was the main reason why evacuation was out of the question. Plants were in operation right up until the 23rd of August. You can ascertain it if you look at a workbook of any employee of the McKitsney plant. But on the 23rd of August, in their workbooks, there appeared stamps signifying they had been fired. Up until the 23rd, nobody had left the service or had been dismissed from the plants, so all families stayed there. All families were left there. We couldn't evacuate because of my father's work. Besides, there was the infamous 227 order, not one step back. If he had left his work, it would have been taken for desertion. My mother worked until the last day, too. Possibly Stalin's order, not one step back, was to the full extent carried out only in the city that bore his name. It not only affected the people that worked at military plants. My mother worked in a school. She went to see the director. Please let me go. My husband is at the front and I have two small children. I've got to save them. His response, I have no permission to do that. I cannot let you go. They didn't take lives of women and children into consideration. Only on the 18th of August, five days prior to the destruction of the city by the Germans, the party regional committee enacted a decree to evacuate orphanages. 
We were not evacuated then. There was no order to evacuate children. Stalingrad children were never evacuated. They evacuated only the children of the city and regional committee's officials, senior officials, so to speak. They were determined to never surrender the city. That was an official announcement. Those leaflets were stuck to each and every post. The reason so many people died here when the city was being bombed was that they simply had no time to escape. This city would not surrender. Under Ciesla's aircraft and artillery fire, panic-struck people ran to the river Volga, hoping to get across somehow. However, very few of them managed to do so. In Stalingrad, there were no bridges connecting the city with the region across the river. All steamboats, barges, motor launches and ferries were at the disposal of the People's Commissariat of Internal Affairs. They were also used to evacuate the wounded. Besides, all the crossings were overcrowded with cattle. Women and children tried to cross the river in boats, on rafts, logs, and some of them even tried to swim across it. When we reached the bank, one cannot imagine what was going on there. There were so many people gathered together. The wounded, the sick, cars and lorries were all together, and still somehow we found ourselves in a tugboat. It wasn't even a boat. Those were logs tied together, a tiny raft. So we started off and a German pilot was circling above us like a hawk. We could even see his face. He shot at us from a machine gun, smiling. Oh God, this is so hard to describe. And I still don't understand how we survived. The bombs rained down upon the city. And there was water all around us, and the raft was almost on its edge. All the cattle fell into the water, and we were in the middle of the raft, screaming with terror. My sister said I was laughing. I must have been in shock. On the riverbank, water was mixed with blood. Corpses were floating. So those who still had the strength to do so pulled the wounded up to the boats and rafts and went across the river. According to official reports, on the 23rd of August, nearly 46,000 civilians died. Some 150,000 people were wounded. These figures might be a little too high, but nobody will ever be able to say exactly how many people fell victim to this battle. The fact that civilians were not evacuated from Stalingrad cannot be considered malicious for definite. Still, as it usually happens, people's deaths were the toll for the miscalculations of the leaders. Apparently, the euphoria of the Supreme Headquarters after the victorious Battle of Moscow in December 1941 affected the plans of new operations. Stalin insisted a general counter-offensive should be launched on the whole front, from Lagoda to the Black Sea. As a result, all winter and spring operations in 1942 were unfinished. All fronts suffered heavy losses. The Red Army suffered the most crushing defeat near Kharkov. It was not only that Stalin underestimated the capability of the German army to regain their strength after hard blows. The main miscalculation of his that led to the Stalingrad tragedy was the fact that he hadn't determined the target of the main strike of the summer offensive in 1942. Stalin believed the Germans would attack Moscow again. The Germans, though, planned to start their main attack in the south. Hitler longed for the Caucasian oil. That is why the German commandment elaborated an operation with code name Blau. It may seem incredible, but on the 19th of June, Soviet troops managed to take hold of a German aircraft that had Major Reichel aboard. Reichel had violated all regulations and taken detailed plans of the oncoming summer offensive with him. The seized documents were shown to Stalin. Hitler was furious when he found out what had happened. However, Stalin took it for another misinformation. Instead, he believed in a purposeful misinformation the German commandment had peddled to the Soviet army commandment before the summer offensive in the south took place. It was a secret order stating the Wehrmacht would launch another attack on Moscow at the end of June 1942. This misinformation campaign is known by its code name, the Kremlin, 
Soviet reconnaissance informed the general staff that the Germans would launch an offensive on the southern flank, but again, like he'd done before the war, Stalin refused to believe anything that differed from his own views. Well, Stalin always stubbornly insisted on his opinion. Even when everybody warned him, saying on the 22nd the war will begin, he relied on his pact with Hitler to the very last. On the 28th of June 1942, German divisions of the South Army started the main operation of the summer campaign Blau. The fact that the Germans reached the River Don created a real panic. Russian soldiers were in extreme need of shells. The Soviet subdivisions often staged attacks only in order to capture German arms and shells. On the 28th of July, the Germans took Rostov. After Rostov and Novocherkask had been captured, Hitler rejoiced. Stalin felt a catastrophe was about to happen, so he issued order number 227, not one step back. In accordance with this order, cowards and panic mongers were to be killed on the spot. Everyone surrendering was considered a traitor. Commanders that let their soldiers surrender were reduced to the ranks. Yes, I'm I read this order myself, to my soldiers. They'd specially taken us to a more or less quiet place. I could see the straight faces of the soldiers. My voice trembled, you know. My throat was dry. My tongue stuck to my palate. The more I read, the more frightened I got. The people sat there gripping each other. They did so to stop shivering. But when we realized we had no right to retreat, we felt a sense of relief. The idea we could not retreat got into our heads. We realized we would die in any event. But if you know you have to die, it's better to think that others will survive. You always fear death. You always want to live. On the 17th of July, the battle reached the Stalingrad region. Worn out, isolated divisions retreating from the Kharkov region were not able to organize the defense of the city. Soviet troops were in utter chaos. There was no leadership. Commanders flew PO2 planes. They maneuvered among Messerschmitt planes, trying to determine the location of their own units. That was the prologue of the battle for Stalingrad. After the 23rd of August, the Luftwaffe Air Squadron for a whole month continuously bombed the city in order to erase it. Even the pilots themselves did not understand why bomb a city that already lay in ruins. From morning to night, we could see our planes bombarding the city. Day after day, the planes overflew Stalingrad. No one can imagine how terrible that all was. The planes swooped so low, and it was not just that they dropped bombs. The planes were equipped with these sirens that hooted dreadfully during air raids. One can hardly imagine the psychological effect it must have had, the way it affected people's minds. People that were there and survived will never be able to forget. Once there was an air bombardment. It was so horrible, so dreadful. My mother seemed to have gone mad. She ran out of the slit trench and dashed to this place. That was somewhere here she ran to, over there to that place. She stood right there on the hill. She raised her hands to the sky and cried, God, save my children, help us. But the bombing did not stop. We fell and crawled, but somehow managed to come down to the railway. We wanted to hide there. We came down to the locomotive depot, and there were headquarters there. There was an underground shelter there and a table. Besides, there was an ink pot, a pen, and some papers. I took them and started to write notes telling who we were. I realized we would die that day. I kept the notes saying who we were and where we were hidden under my blouse.
Despite the horrors and the shock they were in, people had the strength to support and render all possible help to one another. When we lived in dugouts and in gullies, oh yes, gullies, we still cared for each other. If we knew that Osminkin, our neighbor, could not walk, we did our best to bring a piece of bread to him. We knew he had to eat something. Every day when bombs rained down upon the city, women and children had to leave their dugouts and set out in search for food, because many of them had no food supplies anymore. When the bombing started back there on the bank, something happened. There was a railway line. It connected Tadyanka railway station with Kubyshev, with that plant and some other objects. They drove a train full of cans in there and it was destroyed by the bombing. The train was destroyed and everything was burnt down. The cans were smoked, but when one opened them, there was tomato sauce inside. That was wonderful, so delicious. Our mothers literally hunted for food, running all over the city in search of food. When the bakery was destroyed, for instance, it was situated right on the river, and the molasses was flowing down the river. The molasses was just pouring out. It was so horrible there. Do you know what molasses is? There were some huge vats there. People came, everyone tried to get closer, but from behind, more and more people arrived. Not that anyone wanted to drown anybody or push anyone down, just that once we saw the molasses, one tried to get it, but the molasses was so sticky and heavy and sometimes women fell into the vats. Some managed to get out, some didn't. The most horrible thing for the people, though, was the thirst. Water supply was stopped on the 23rd of August. From then on, polluted water became a normality. We used the water from the river Volga after we hadn't had a drop of water for three days. The water tasted of oil and other things, but we had no choice. After my mother filtered it through a cloth, we drank it. The parents were at the factory and we had no water and we were thirsty. So we had to crawl down to the river to draw the water. That's when it happened. I can remember my sister crawling down to our neighbors and a bomb hit. It tore her apart and I saw it. I couldn't think of water anymore. I couldn't think about anything. On the 10th of September, the 62nd Army retreated to the city. Together with the 64th Army, it had been entrusted with the task of defending Stalingrad. On the 13th of September, 6.45 a.m., the Wehrmacht forces supported by the Luftwaffe started assaulting the city. This day is usually considered the first day of the street fighting. The 62nd Army soldiers showed strong resistance to the Germans. The day before, command of the army had been given to General Chuykov. Despite the resistance, by the evening the Germans managed to advance to the outskirts, to the factory's barricades in Red October. They managed to destroy the most important workshops that had manufactured new tanks. The breakthrough of the German tank corps to the River Volga cut off the 62nd Army troops from the 64th Army. On September 14th, the Germans captured the hill of the city, named Mamai Kurgan, and broke through to the center of the city, to the railway station area. Here, fierce battles commenced. The river Tsaritsa was a place of raging battles too. The information that the 71st Wehrmacht Division broke through to the center of Stalingrad brought boundless joy to Hitler's headquarters. By evening, the information was delivered to the Kremlin. Stalin ordered the 13th Guards Division, led by Rodimtsev, to cross the river Volga and enter the city in order to help Tchuykov. The days of the city seemed to be numbered. If Rodimtsev had not disembarked on the 13th, there would have been no troops in the city ready to defend Stalingrad. If they had landed the troops a day or two later, Stalingrad would have been captured. There would have been nobody to defend it. There were only 10 divisions left. At this crucial moment, when the Germans were combating in the center of the city and were breaking through to the river, within two nights General Rodimtsev's division moved from the region across the river to Stalingrad. 
They crossed the Volga on motor launches, on tugs, longboats, and even on fisher boats. However, only six out of the 10,000 managed to get across the river. That was the central crossing, and in some places here we also tried to cross the river. Soldiers on the barge were in full combat gear. This means they had two grenades, two cartridge drums, a submachine gun, a roll, a helmet, and a spade. When a bomb hit the barge, the Germans seemed to be bombing from the Mamai Kurgan or from somewhere else. The soldiers fell into the water in full combat gear. They cried for help, but nobody could help them. They instantly drowned as they could not take the gear off. Those who were still on the barge cried because they could not help those guys. Some of them lost their brothers there. They went underwater and never participated in any battles. Rudintsev's guardsmen already jumped into the water before even reaching the bank. They immediately entered into a fierce combat with the enemy, defending the nearby streets. Right upon arrival at the bank, the fighting started. There was no shelter whatsoever, no building or anything. There was nothing there. We didn't know where to hide. The soldiers of the 13th Division managed to break through to the mill, though. In a fight man against man, they chased away the Germans, even though many of them weren't even armed properly. We were told the first battle would be like that. They said that as it was our first battle, we would only have this amount of weapons. That's all there would be. Within the first 24 hours of the battle, the 13th Guards Division lost 30% of its soldiers. But at least the Germans had been driven out of the city center. Nevertheless, the Germans advanced rapidly, and many citizens of Stalingrad soon found themselves in occupied territory. On the 31st of August, Hitler ordered to eliminate the men and take the women out of the city. Luckily, it wasn't quite carried out in this way. Then they started to force us out of the slit trenches. They had machine guns aimed at us. We didn't want to come out at first. Then it was said we would be resettled and just had to get out. I do not know who those people were, but they said we had to come out. Well, we didn't have much to take along. We carried a rucksack. Maria also took a warm blanket, a bucket, a cup, and some spoons with her. I supported mother as my mother was too weak to walk on her own, so we marched along the street and kept going. On the 14th of September, a huge line of civilians left the city and moved towards the west and the north, towards the regions occupied by the Germans. Most of them were women and children. On their way, they were bombed by aircraft and shot by artillery. Those who survived kept going. They were hungry, sick and exhausted. They were in a state of shock and meanwhile, the nights were getting colder. The Stalingrad battle in the memory of most Russians is firmly tied to the great victory of the Soviet troops in 1943. The tragic fate of the inhabitants of Stalingrad, however, is more or less ignored. In 
During the Soviet times, historians always stated that in spite of constant air raids and street fighting, the people would not leave their city. It was an incredible tragedy. When it came to the question of evacuation, Stalin said, soldiers do not defend empty cities, let the people stay. At that point in time, there were one million people in the city, including refugees. It was both blocking and encouraging the soldiers. So they would say, there's no land for us behind the Volga. That was not only just a saying. From the 13th of September onwards, the battle took place directly in the streets of Stalingrad. Paulus' army had succeeded in seizing Mamai Hill and the railway station. In the north, it moved towards the outskirts, towards the factory's barricades and Red October, and destroyed the main workshops of the tractor plant. If it hadn't been for Radimtsev's division, the city would have been seized. With enormous losses, this division managed to recapture parts of the city center and fiercely fought for every single street. Though the German infantry repeatedly pushed them towards the river Volga, Radimtsev's guards stood firm and never gave way completely. The Germans must have thought that no one had survived after all these bombings and the artillery fire. But to their surprise, a head popped up. There, there, there. And then we fired. We just didn't let them pass through, not a single one of them. On the 22nd of September, the Wehrmacht arrives right at the ferry harbor. And from here, the German artillery is able to bombard the main passages across the river. On the next day, the Siberian 248th Division of Colonel Batyuk launches a counterattack from the opposite side of the river. But the Siberians were forced to retreat, as were the troops that desperately tried to recapture Mamai Hill. Rodimtsev's troops managed to drive the Germans away for a little while, but during the following days, neither of them is able to gain control of the hill. In September 1942, the 34th Regiment Battalion attacked the Germans. Right here, we literally had to walk over dead bodies as there were corpses of sailors lying around in three layers and helmets and their sailors' caps nearby. They had already begun to decompose and the smell was awful. It's terrible to remember these things. More than 60 years have passed since then, but I remember exactly how awful it was to step over those dead bodies. We had taken the first entrenchment, the second, third, fourth one, but only for 24 hours. At night they summoned their troops and arrived with tanks. They were vastly superior to us and chased us away. In spite of all of this, even in war, life goes on. Here, on Mamai Hill, there were also women and children in the trenches. And in the middle of the battle, a baby was born. I don't even remember if I cried or not. It was so terrible that I could only say, Mother, it's starting to come, please hand me the bandages, the cotton wool and the scissors. She did so. A girl was born. I cut the umbilical cord and my mother took my daughter with her. The battle for the city center lasted till the 26th of September. On that day, Paulus sent a message to Berlin saying the Reich battle banner has been hoisted over the Communist Party building. The next day, the German newspapers opened with the headline, Stalingrad Seized, 
but it wasn't true and would never actually happen. The German offensive had come to a halt. Even though they were able to defend the city, the state of the 62nd Army was extremely bad. The narrow strip along the river Volga was hard to defend. There was nobody left. Not in the first line, nor the second defense line. No troops, nothing. And our division was situated along this tiny strip of land, along the bank between Tsaritsi and the Mamai Hill. On the right river bank where Stalingrad lay, it was impossible to implement large caliber artillery. Most of that was firing at the Germans from the opposite left riverside. The main infantry's weapons in the city were machine guns, counter-tank rifles, submachine gun grenades and rifles. Whereas for an ordinary soldier, a submachine gun was out of the question. Only commanders had them. The Germans were firing at us in the dark of night from Mame Hill. But they also used these rockets with flashlights, which were held up by their parachutes so they could see well enough. And that's how they fired from up there. But in spite of all this, more and more Russian soldiers kept crossing the Volga. The desperately needed additional supply of weapons and provisions came from the left bank of the river. I'm sure nobody knew exactly how many of us were actually there. It was just as impossible as trying to count the waves rolling in from the sea, one after the other. When new troops arrived, they would immediately be thrown into battle. Some died, others were wounded. Reinforcement to a regiment was 300 men a day. But in the evening, in the evening there would be two or three of those yeah. men left. Well, and every day the same procedure, a mincing machine. On the 26th of September, the Stalingrad Defense Committee ordered to gather orphan children underneath the shattered theater in the air raid shelter. Some of the boys worked as messengers in the army. They became sons to the regiments. I remember when I killed the first German. I was sick the whole day. I had no time to think, not even for a second. We were standing guard, me and the sergeant major. Then we went to sleep and I remained sitting. And then suddenly appeared this hulk of a man. He obscured the whole of the moon. I pulled up my rifle and fired the whole cartridge clip at him. A hundred bullets. I could see parts of him come flying out of his back and he collapsed on top of me. If he had seen me first, it would have been the end of me. It was only a matter of split seconds. Well, I sat down and began to vomit. I just couldn't bear having killed a man. Instead of an organized defense of the city, a grim and unclear street battle evolved. Russian commander Chuikov ordered the front line to move up closer to the German position, roughly as close as 30 meters. That made it harder for the Wehrmacht to deploy heavy artillery and aircraft guns. The Air Force and the artillery. Yes, it happened that we were fired at by our own people. They could hardly see where exactly the front line was. They fired at the zone where we and the Russians lay very close to one another. And so quite often casualties occurred. Then we had the idea to lay flags out so the pilots could see where we were. Yes, that's what we did. The German generals took the weak resistance of the Russian troops as a sign of a retreat behind the river. But the Soviets kept fighting for every single meter. In the beginning, Germans as well as Russians entered the street battle with their maximum forces. But to their surprise, they found children and women which hadn't been evacuated in almost every cellar. The 
unique thing about the Battle of Stalingrad was the length and the bloodiness of the fighting, and the fact that so many civilians had to suffer. That's where the awful tragedy of the battle lies. We lived in holes. In Leningrad, the people were able to live in their flats. But here, we had nothing. We had to remain underground in complete darkness. Against our will, we were in the war, because we hadn't evacuated. We literally lived on the front line. Even in the well-known Pavlov house, there were civilians though on General Paula's map, it was marked as a fortress. For 58 days, soldiers of Radimtsev's division defended this building in which still 30 people lived. These were old men, women, children, and even an infant. At night, the soldiers went to the mill and brought back flour, which was mixed with sand and made into flat cakes. One drank the water from broken pipes. It was mixed with blood, but we boiled it and drank it. They gave me flat cakes for a pacifier, anything I could suck on, more or less. We survived, but it was horrible. My mother became ill with dysentery and died, and I became ill with diphtheria. The soldiers said, adult people die, and this is a baby. We'll dig a little pit. And when they were digging the pit, the spade hit a piece of metal, and it was a small icon. It was what saved me, perhaps. Well, anyway, the soldiers gave it to me and said, our Zina survived. The German infantry tried to avoid battles near destroyed buildings. They called them rat holes because the enemy was quasi invisible there. They were especially afraid of Colonel Batyuk's Siberian division. His tiger hunters were able to sneak up unnoticed. On hearing the slightest rustle, frightened Germans would fire straight away at anything. German army doctors often diagnosed nervous stress syndrome provoked by too much combat deployment. Civilians had no doctors to take care of them. In September, during the night, a bomb dropped on our place and killed our daddy. The bomb was dropped in the corner of the house, to be precise, and my daddy caught a splinter of the bomb to his head, and we saw his brains. We fearfully crawled around in the darkness, not knowing. And then we came near to him, and my younger sister touched part of my daddy's brain. He did not come around. He did not open his eyes. For two or three days, he remained in a coma. We stayed close to him, and then the agony of death began. He raised one hand, and I gave him my hand, and he took it, and he died. Leaving the life behind, he was holding my hand, which I could hardly entangle from his anymore. Chances to survive in this massacre were minimal. People died not only due to bullets or missiles, they died of thirst, hunger, and pollution. Certainly the inhabitants of Leningrad lived through a lot, and the food they had was not much. But in Stalingrad we had nothing to eat. People forget this. The memory of this feeling of hunger has haunted me ever since. For example, once a train full of wheat was hit on its way up north, and we went to get the burnt wheat, but it did not last very long. Imagine what it was like with nothing to eat. And the children want to eat. At one point, I saw something that looked like a black grain again. And I thought it was a piece of bread. I was completely worn out. I crawled over to pick it up, but it was black pepper. It remained a miracle how the inhabitants of Stalingrad were able to survive during five months of ongoing battle. They hid themselves in ruins of houses, in cellars, in wells, in trenches, in caves, 
dug in the riverbanks. In between bombings, people crawled out from their shelters to fetch water and anything similar to food. It may sound strange, but this was mainly children. Their small figures were less noticeable for German snipers. I learned to crawl over to the Germans and obtain something, that is, to beg for something. How did I do that? I sang Katyusha, danced, played tricks. Evidently, the struggle for survival had awakened an artistic quality in me. I always went to the older ones, the ones with hairy arms. It was hot, and everybody's uniform sleeves were rolled up. And I looked for those with red hair and glasses. I reckon they might have sons just like me and would respond to my begging. I never went straight to the younger ones. One never knew what would happen. But with the elder, red-haired, wearing spectacles, I was lucky. Every morning the same procedure. Dozens, maybe even hundreds of people from the city districts occupied by the Germans went to the river Volga to drink water. They came with kettles, buckets and cans. Then they had to go back first through our positions, then through the German ones. At this point in time, nobody would fire. Evidently, there was an unspoken agreement, because everybody needed to drink. Our soldiers understood civilians needed to drink, and so did the Germans. In October, the German Wehrmacht occupied practically all of Stalingrad. They occupied six out of seven districts. Only the Kirov district, which was surrounded by the enemy from three sides, did not fall to the Germans. There, the soldiers of the 64th Army of General Shumilov stood their ground. In the seized territory, the Germans found more than 100,000 civilians. They established a regime with a city commander and police forces. They register the inhabitants, hand out passports, and try to channel the stream of refugees behind their front lines. People who did not register were threatened to be shot. We were useless to them, not out of fear, but the city was too crowded. We posed a problem to them, us tens of thousands of civilians. Somehow they had to feed us and give us water. In addition, there were epidemic diseases, like typhus, for example, anything that spreads in this heat. A serious problem. In September 1942, it was terribly hot. Corpses started decomposing in just moments. After three days, the smell would be insupportable. Even after two or three hours, and it started to smell. It was nearly impossible to breathe. The smell that the dead bodies gave off was so strong. And neither side let the other remove the corpses. Only after it had become unavoidable, because of epidemic diseases, then flags were hoisted on both sides. A time limit of two hours for removing the corpses was agreed on. Five minutes over time, and you'd be fired at. The Germans undertook the largest measures of evacuation of the civilians on the 5th of October. At first, the refugees were driven away to the so-called distribution camps. Here, the people were selected. The ones still able to work were supposed to be sent to Germany via train to work in labor camps. Others, according to Hitler's orders, simply chased away into the steppe, or some were sent to the camp Belaya Kalitva, which was 300 kilometers away. Just try to imagine what the inhabitants of Stalingrad lived through, leaving the city. Thinking back now, they all started to cry. Such a tragic fate. We were tormented by hunger the whole time. In that camp, I only consisted of skin and bones. You probably saw these photos of us, the interned children, just skeletons covered with rotting skin. The 
The SS Special Unit 4A followed General Paulus' army into Stalingrad and commenced terrible repression against Jews, communists, Komsomol members and people suspected to be partisans. Here stood the two-story building in which the commander's office was. If I remember correctly, it was right here on this side. That's where civilians were hanged. They put signs around their necks saying partisan or tried to resist the Germans and so on and on. The civilians were standing against the wall of that ordinary two-story building. And opposite, there were two machine guns aimed straight at them. First, there was this German guy sitting there. He was eating watermelons. He cut the watermelon with a dagger. So this German guy was sitting there and eating. And somebody must have called him. And he walked away but said something like, run, and gestured with his machine gun. It was obvious what he meant. The people standing against the wall began to discuss the situation. It was only later that I understood my mother was frightened because it was well known that our father was a communist and a member of the party. Let's just say the Germans didn't exactly like communists or Jews. Nobody would miss them, they used to say. And so my mother quickly made up her mind and we took a chance and ran. Others also ran away. And the rest of the people were probably shot because I heard the sound of the machine guns. On the 11th of November, the German leadership gave orders to finally conquer Stalingrad, a last attempt. The Germans forced their enemy to retreat further towards the river Volga, and so isolated General Lutnikov's division from the others. Up until now, this area is called Lutnikov's Island. His regiments each only consisted of 70 to 100 soldiers. For 40 days and nights, this division resisted the enemy, which had been attacking from three sides. The bridgehead they were defending was only 700 by 400 meters. Lutnikov's island was completely cut off with no supply routes. Soldiers at 30 bullets per rifle left. Here on Ludnikov Island, where the 138th Division was heroically fighting, with civilians by their side. Even though the soldiers were fighting day and night, they only had a daily ration of 5 grams of sugar, 10 grams of millet, and 150 grams of bread. And this they even shared with the starving locals. The plan for the Russian counter-offensive under the codename Uranus had been made for quite some time and was kept strictly secret. On the 19th of November 1942, the time had finally come. All of a sudden, there was this feeling of joy. The offensive has started. We're going to be saved. It was a very important moment, psychologically important especially. The distant sound of soldiers attacking and shouting, hurrah, that's what we were waiting for. The operation turns out to be successful. And four days later, the troops from the southwest and from Stalingrad joined forces in Kalach and Sovetsky. Twenty-two Wehrmacht divisions were circled in. Early in the morning on the 24th of November, Hitler's fatal and unyielding orders arrive at the headquarters of the 6th Army. Retreat out of the question, and Stalingrad was to be defended till the very last soldier. The Stalingrad fortress was to be held under all circumstances. Our cemeteries became larger each day. 
The German soldiers were unable to deal with the attack and were nearly cut off from supplementation. Quickly their situation became hopeless and desperate. They suffered heavy casualties. Thousands starved or froze to death. The remaining could only pray. And the living only hoped to make it home. Until the end of December, Soviet troops managed to advance 200 kilometers and freed more than 1,200 villages. A knock at the window, and Maria went to have a look and saw a star on the cap and cried out, Ours, ours have arrived! Oh, I remember it exactly. They wore coats made of sheepskin and had machine guns. They were so handsome, young and full of joy. And we kneeled down and embraced their legs and their dusty boots. And we kissed those boots. Our liberators, you are our dear beloved. And we all came down from the oven bench where we were sitting and threw ourselves to their embraces. They moved into our small hut. We hadn't eaten anything for the last three days. And there was absolutely nothing left to eat or drink, and nothing we could offer. They started to make tea, and brought boxes of cheese, and loaves of bread. And they sat at the table eating, and have forgotten about us, and we tried hard not to look at the table. And Ira, staring at them, said, Oh, how I wish, I wish. And I said to her, Be quiet, quiet, look the other way, don't look, Ira. We were so hungry, and they had bread and cheese. Finally, one of them noticed and said, Hey, pals, they're hungry. The Germans desperately tried to save their encircled troops by sending in more and more soldiers. A large amount of troops was concentrated in the district north of Kutelnikovo and was set to the task of breaking up the ring. General Field Marshal von Manstein was in charge of the operation. His troops outnumbered the Russians and were technically superior, but nevertheless the Germans were stopped and the main route towards Stalingrad was blocked until reinforcement troops arrived. When the Soviets took over Kotelnikovo on the 29th of December, the fate of the surrounded German army was finally decided. General Paulus actually thought about trying to escape from Stalingrad, but in the end, he stuck to his orders. Even today, the discussion goes on whether Paulus and his superiors had taken the right decisions. It keeps getting ignored how we the soldiers felt about all this. We were the ones who were sitting in snow-covered holes, dying of hunger in Stalingrad. They talk too little about the simple soldiers. I only hear talk about the ones giving the orders. It was us dying of hunger and cold, not them. We had no more high hopes anymore, just the simple wish to find something to eat. We hardly ever slept anymore. We were grateful if we could doze off for two or three hours during the day, but we had nothing to eat. I tried to organize something for my soldiers. They would even have eaten rats. They'd already caught some and were going to eat them. I tried to convince them not to because of the risk of catching diseases. And we carried lice in such quantities. Nobody talked about that, but there were so many of them, we even had trouble buttoning up our jackets. Along the whole eastern front, the Germans celebrated Christmas. But in Stalingrad, the Christmas celebration was very different. 
In the month of December, we had so little food. Our Christmas gift was one extra slice of bread and one extra cigarette. That was it. We had a map in our bunker. We turned it over, drew a Christmas tree on it, and stuck it back on the wall. We still had a few candles left over, and so we put them up near the tree. That was Christmas for us. A slice of bread and a cigarette. We were listening to Lily Marlene on the radio. Every evening at 7 p.m., Radio Belgrade broadcasted it for all the soldiers. So all gathered round the radio. It was our favorite song. On New Year's Eve, there were about 12 to 15,000 civilians left in Stalingrad, who desperately tried to survive. The destroyed city somehow continued to exist. All of us became thinner and more cadaverous. If the encirclement had not taken place on the 29th of November, but let's say two months later, there wouldn't have been any survivors. People, including myself, actually ate boots. That's how bad things were. Boots were made of leather and we boiled them. Black boots turned white, and the tastiest part was the tongue of the boot, which had rolled itself up through the boiling. Well, what did it taste like? I don't know. Maybe carpenter's glue. Well, the inhabitants of Leningrad knew such things. Just as the inhabitants of Stalingrad knew it, I suppose all in all, I must have eaten a whole boot. On the 8th of January 1943, the Soviets issued an ultimatum. In order to avoid further unnecessary bloodshed, the Germans were to unconditionally surrender within 24 hours. Hitler refuses to capitulate and so forces the 6th German army to let the ultimatum pass. In the morning of the 10th of January, the final phase of the battle for Stalingrad begins. Thousands of guns and cannons start opening fire and until the 20th of January, terrible battles commenced on every front line. Those sons of bitches still didn't surrender. So we were obliged to fight to the death. They were now looking death straight in the face. Even after they'd run out of ammunition, they fired at our tanks using chunks of wood. It was the middle of January when most of us started to write our farewell letters home. It was clear to everybody that there were only three possibilities left. You would either be wounded, or taken prisoner, or killed. In the evening of the 26th of January, not far from the village Red October, the Russian troops of the River Don Front managed to break through to the troops of the 62nd Army on the Mamai Hill. It was a special moment, since Tchuikov's 62nd Army had been isolated for almost five months since the beginning of the battle. A group of Germans also arrived to the festivities at the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Stalingrad. There were about seven of them. One of them was able to speak Russian quite well and we talked. We were standing here at the slope and he goes, how could we not make these hundred meters to the river Volga? I also showed him where our headquarters were, and he just looked on and asked again. With all our superior forces, the tanks, the artillery, the air force, and a hundred times more soldiers, how could we fail to seize this tiny strip of land? I thumbed my nose at him, and he laughed. You Russian magicians! As a result of the joint forces of the Russian troops, the 6th German army was divided in two parts now. One part, commanded by General Paulus, is trapped in the city center of Stalingrad. The other part, under General Strecker's command, is comprised in the northern part, near the factories. 
significant German resistance was impossible now. 26 January, the On the 26th of January, the staff of the 6th Army moved here into the cellar of this department store. Paulus himself was unable to cope with the situation. When Hitler awarded him with the rank of Field Marshal, this gesture clearly was an invitation to suicide. But he said to General Pfeffer, I have no intentions to shoot myself for this bohemian lance corporal's sake. On the 31st of January 1943, Paolo's staff, including the field marshal, was taken captive. Hitler became furious on hearing the news. A German field marshal had never before surrendered. An order to fight to the last bullet was issued to the remaining troops. They surrendered two days later, on the 2nd of February. The commander of the Don troops said that to free Stalingrad without another single shot, he would have needed only another week. The Germans had nowhere to land their airplanes and had no supplies left. Soldiers were starving, demoralized, completely worn out, wounded and helpless. They were on the brink of surrendering anyway. All we actually had to do was wait. Each day there would be one battalion of Germans less, but we absolutely had to win by tomorrow. And it was to be a beautiful victory, at any cost. So for me, it's painful to have to account for the fact that we ended this battle on the 2nd of February with a mighty bombardment of the leftovers of the enemy. This happened in the northern outskirts. Yes, that's where the factories were, and yes, the German soldiers too. But there were our people there as well. And how many of them were killed by our missiles, nobody ever counted. In those last few days of the battle, nobody counted them. Round about 113,000 soldiers and officers were taken prisoner, including 22 generals. During the three weeks before that, about the same amount of German soldiers had died. We lived on the banks of the river Volga. The German prisoners were dragged before us. What a picture! They were in rags, covered with blankets, straw was used to cover their feet. It was very cold. Winter was frosty. Endless lines, thousands upon thousands, were marching past. In the morning of the 2nd of February, the Soviets liberated the last remaining parts of the city center. First we heard thunder, and then suddenly somebody knocking at the door. We couldn't see anything, the shutters were closed. Then we heard voices. What are you waiting for? There are Germans inside, throw a grenade. Well, my brothers and sisters, all of us started crying, don't kill us, we're Russian. One of the soldiers entered and saw us and shouted to the others, there are only the old and children inside. When they walked in and saw us, they cried. To celebrate their victory, the soldiers carried in tin cans and loaves of bread from the other side of the river for the remaining local inhabitants, who had been locked in for more than five long months. Spontaneously, soldiers fired salute to one another, and people embraced, laughed, sang and danced. The 
the city of the sun, the Volga's pearl. That's what was pre-war Stalingrad. Now it was the city of corpses. Everything lay dead and abandoned. The silence after the battle was frightening. There were mines and bombs everywhere. There were no streets left, only ruins and piles of rubbish. Buildings that miraculously had remained intact with their shattered windows looked as if they had empty eye sockets. It was a terrible sight. And especially painful to look at was the fountain in the center of the city, shot to pieces, but the children around it still dancing. How many children of the city had been shot or buried alive under ruins? At the end of the battle, there were only seven and a half thousand Stalingrad inhabitants still alive, not counting the Kirov region, which the Germans hadn't occupied. In the city center, only seven inhabitants had survived. But even that was a miracle, because in this fiercely battled for area, every 20 seconds a Soviet soldier had died. According to an investigation issued by the general staff, the average duration of life on the front line during the Stalingrad battle was, for a soldier, one day, platoon commander, three days, company commander, seven days, battalion commander, 11 days, regiment commander, 20 days. Victory here in Stalingrad was won by an incredible amount of bloodshed. It was the blood of soldiers and of the inhabitants. But it's not just about the bloodshed. There are other irreparable losses. Such as the crippled souls of children who had to live through this. They carry a stigma. They were deprived of their childhood. These children never saw a merry-go-round, not even toys. After all these bombings, the occupation, the fears, the hunger, I, for the first time in my life, saw a tulip at the age of six. When making this film, we always put this question to all eyewitnesses. What is Stalingrad for you today? Does this city upon the river Volga appear in your nightmares? Were you able to let go of the memories? The impressions are so intense in my memory. They'll remain there for the rest of my life. Of course, the nightmares will appear. They will so until I die. Sometimes I wake up at night and I can hear bombarding, attack, up until now, after 60 years. I remember I once went to the island of Réunion, a French island in the southern hemisphere. I was lying in a bungalow there, looking up at the stars. The stars look very different down there, unlike ours. And then, all of a sudden, I had this memory of what the stars looked like in Stalingrad. I could remember the stars precisely and saw them right there before my eyes. Stalingrad never lets you go.